you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12. And also get 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. While you're turning, I'd like to say I'm glad that all of you are here today. And I'm thankful for the ones that are listening on the internet. And I pray that this message will be a help to all of us and that we can learn more about spiritual maturity. So we'll read 1 Corinthians 3, 12 first. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Talking about building, talking about a foundation. And we know that foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 11. For the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now then go to 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you again for the opportunity we have together. We thank you for the ones that listen on the internet. And we pray, Lord, as we study today on spiritual maturity, I pray, Lord, that we'll gain more knowledge about the gold and the silver and precious stones, the wisdom and knowledge and understanding, faith and hope and charity. And I pray that uh, we'll all be edified here, the ones that listen on the internet. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Like I said, I read these verses to you. Uh, we want to, I want to talk about spiritual maturity. And when you do that, you're understanding what God's doing today when you're mature. And you're understanding what God's doing in our life as believers. What He's doing in the body of Christ. And, and that's, that's the goal. We want to be mature adults. Uh, sons, of, and we want to be able to walk based on who we are in Christ and grow in that maturity. And the thing is, there's a key verse that Paul gives us in Galatians chapter 2. Turn to Galatians chapter 2 and look at verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. This is a key verse to me, and it's really got a grip on my heart now. Look at this more in Galatians 2.20. Notice what Paul says. I'm crucified with Christ. That's Romans 6. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. You don't have to go any further. Notice it says, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And that, that's what we need to understand and remember is yet not I, but Christ. And that's our life. And you living, when you live that way in Galatians 2.20, then when you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there and and look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 3 12, you can ask yourself something here. Living Galatians 2.20, yet not I but Christ, that will keep you from living wood, hay, and stubble. When you get to 1 Corinthians 3 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. If you live yet not I but Christ, that will keep out that wood, hay, and stubble. Because you're going, to, you're going to, when you understand who you are in Christ, and you say, yet not I, but Christ, where you're going to live uh, on that gold, silver, with that gold, silver, and precious stones. And we're going to look at that today. You know, and I, I mentioned this to you last week, when you read 1 Corinthians 3.12, are we capable of building on these six listed here? Are we capable of building... Uh, there in 1 Corinthians 3, 12, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. We are. Yes, we are. And we understand about the wood, hay, and stubble. We understand about a human viewpoint. We understand about the flesh. We understand about religion. And when, when, you, did, when you build on human viewpoint, when you build on that flesh or religion, all you're doing is building wood, hay, and stubble is what you're doing. So what I'm going to do today, I've got it on the board for you. I put gold, silver, and precious stones. I've also put wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And I also put faith, hope, and love. And you're going to see a similarity as we read these. 
So go to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. We're talking about spiritual maturity. And Proverbs chapter 16, and we're going to read verse 16. Proverbs 16, 16. I've never noticed this verse until I studied this out like I should. I've read it many times, but Proverbs 16, 16. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? You notice that how the wisdom and gold are connected. And to get understanding, rather be chosen than silver. So you've got understanding there, and you've got silver connected. And I thought that's interesting. Well, look at Proverbs chapter 20. So we've looked at gold and silver, and wisdom and understanding. We'll look at Proverbs chapter 20, and verse 15. Proverbs 20, and verse 15. There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are precious jewel. <clears throat> Notice that there is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. And when you think about precious jewels, you've got to go back to 1 Corinthians 3 12. You think about precious stones, and you've got knowledge there. You see how all, all of those are connected? And we're talking about material. That's what we're talking about. Well, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and look at verse 12 again. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12. We've mentioned gold, silver, and precious stones. We've also connected wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul says, Now if any man build upon this foundation, notice the word build, well, what, what are we to be building? We're going to build in our inner man. That's how you build. When you, when you start talking about wisdom and understanding knowledge, they're connected to gold, silver, and precious stone. You're building in your inner man. That's, that's important that we see that. Uh, also, how, when, you, when you think about gold, silver, precious stones, wisdom, and understanding, and knowledge, then think about how Paul's letters are laid out. How you've got Romans is the foundation. It's the cross work of Jesus Christ. It tells you how to be saved. Then you build on that with Ephesians. And that tells you, that's advanced doctrine there. And your Romans have 1st, 2nd Corinthians and Galatians with it. But then you, you've got the framework of the foundation. Uh, you've got Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Well, when you think about spiritual maturity, then let's go and look at wisdom and understanding and knowledge in advanced doctrine. Let's go over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And look at verse 9. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. We're talking about spiritual maturity. We're talking about building up that doctrine in our inner man. And look at Colossians 1, 9, how Paul prays over here in, in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Colossians 1, 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. So Paul's praying for these believers. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You know, he's praying for these believers. He's praying they're, they're mature, but he's praying that they'll advance on in that maturity with spirit, with knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And when they do that, that's gold, silver, and precious stones. So, and you'll notice what he says there in verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord. And don't even read any further, but how do you walk worthy? You walk worthy with the knowledge in verse 9 of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's how you walk worthy. That's how you walk based on who you are in Christ. These believers at Colossae there, they were advanced in their, in their doctrine maturing, but he's praying for them that they'll be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that, they, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. And that's how Paul prayed for them. And you see, you see so much today, wood, hay, and stubble, the way people pray 
they're praying, Lord, give me this material thing. Give me this car. Give me this house. Give me this and give me that. And Paul prayed with advanced doctrine there to these believers there that they'd be filled with wisdom, knowledge, and wisdom and spiritual understanding. There's a big difference there. On that, and that's the way you pray. Our prayer life, we are able to talk to the Lord and communicate with Him because we, we have a spirit that's alive. And His spirit. And we talk back and forth to Him. He's given us His Word. He talks to us through His Word as we read it. And we, we understand about the praying. The praying is thankfulness. You, you can talk to the Lord. Lord, I'm going through this situation. I know I, I need help and I know my help will come from you, from your Word. And I know as I read the Word of God and build up that your Word in my inner man, I'll have strength to go through that situation. That's how you talk to Him. And you pray about it. And then you give Him thanks for what He's done. It, it's all in His Word. Now you think about wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And you think about de uh, definitions, for example. Wisdom. Where do we get it from? You know, people say, where do you get the wisdom? We get ours. What's to us? Romans through Philemon. The rest of the Bible is for our learning. We read it all. But that's where we get it at. And wisdom is knowledge plus the ability to use that knowledge to the best advantage. That's what it is. God's wisdom tells us who to follow today. You know, when we read Romans through Philemon, God's wisdom tells us who should we follow today. And that's the Apostle Paul. He's our apostle. He's our spokesperson. Knowledge, you know something. You think about knowledge. You know something, understanding, you, you take taking that skillful use of knowledge and put it in the details of life. You gain, you read the Word of God, you get the knowledge, you take that knowledge and that understanding, you take that skillful use of knowledge and put it in the details of our life. That's what we're doing with it. Well, that's why I go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4 now. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and look at verse 8. <clears throat> This verse here will really get a grip on us when we, we understand what we're doing now is a benefit. What we're going to be doing out in the ages to come is going to be a benefit. You think about 1 Timothy 4 8, for bodily exercise profit of little. And we're talking about the religious system. When you, again, I've mentioned that to you. But if you forgot, it's that bodily exercise profit of little. That's more on the religious side. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is. Notice the life that now is. That's present. That's what we're living now. And of that which is to come. Well, that's the future out there in the ages to come. So, when you talk about spiritual maturity, and I put it on the board for you, and let me say something. A lot of, a lot of believers today struggle when you bring up spiritual maturity. You know, you can talk to people about spiritual maturity and they struggle. Why? Well, they don't understand where maturity is, what maturity is, where maturity is and what it looks like. They don't understand it. And to give you an example of this, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're talking about spiritual, understanding where maturity is and what it looks like. We'll look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13. This is going to help you on what I've got on the board about faith, hope, and love. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. And that charity there, by the way, is love. So notice faith, hope, and charity. And understand something. We have some faith. When we believe the Word of God. Well, where do we get the faith? And I answered it. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 tells us when you read and you believe what you read, it's the Word of God. It's going to work effectually in, in us. And that's what it does. And we have some hope as we believe, read the Word of God. Knowledge, hope is knowing something. God's Word set before us uh, but God's Word set before us a hope. And we have charity. You think about faith, hope, and charity. Well, charity is understanding. Uh, you think about that. I don't have them in the order there, but faith is 
Charity is understanding, take the wisdom and knowledge and apply it to the details of life. So what do we apply to life? We apply charity. You think about faith, hope, and charity, and charity is love. You apply charity, and what that is, that's called love in action. When you've got charity. When as a mature saint, you've got love in action. You've got charity. When you have charity in your life, you think the way God thinks. You know, Paul says in Corinthians, you know, the mind of Christ. They have the mind of Christ. Think that way. And that's what maturity does. Spiritual maturity, what it begins to look like, is faith, hope, charity. And that charity is love and action. That's why I put love up there. It's love and action. So, remember that as we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're going to look in verse 3. We're talking about faith, hope, and charity. And we've already mentioned about spiritual maturity, gold, silver, and precious stones. You know, when you build on that foundation, gold, silver, and precious stones, that's spiritual maturity. That's wisdom and understanding knowledge. That's faith, hope, and love, or charity. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and the Son of God and our Father. No, sir, he says, remember without ceasing your work of faith. Faith comes by hearing, so that faith comes by hearing, you hear the Word of God. And labor of love, there's that charity. There's that agape love there. There's that love in action there. And patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God and our Father. So your work of faith and labor of love, charity and action. And when you've got charity and you've got love and action, you're applying the Word in the details of your life. You think like God thinks in your life as a believer. That's love and action. And patience of hope there. You know, you read that verse, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, it talks about there the patient and the patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, a, a need for patience in this present world. I was talking to some this week, and and I, you know, regardless of what we see in this life, we've we've seen so many changes already since we've been in this world, and we're going to see more if if we're allowed to live or if the Lord tarries on His coming. And you have to remember this. All these changes are taking place. Satan's the god of this world. And regardless of how bad it gets and all that, it has nothing to do when the Lord's coming. He knows when He's coming. And what we have to do is set our affection on things above and not get distracted over what's going on politically, government, or whatever with people. All of the world don't get distracted with it, but stay focused based on who we are in Christ and realize that we've got a message to give out, the gospel that saves, and also we've got the truth, and once they're saved, that they can come to the knowledge of the truth, and they can walk based on who they are in Christ. So we've got a lot going for us, and it's not a matter of saying how long, Lord. And that's Paul was saying there about them, and patience of hope, in our Lord Jesus Christ and sight of God and our Father. You know, I'm coming. How do we know that? Titus 2.13, 2, we won't turn, but it says looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, you know, when we talk our Heavenly Father every day, and we, we know He knows when His Son's coming back for us. We understand that. And we're not asking when, we're not asking how long, but we're just setting our affection on things above, doing the work of the ministry, uh, as long as we're in this uh, body that we're in, this container that I'm in, and if once I'm out of this container, my spirit and soul will leave, well, I'm out from the body and presence of the Lord, so I'll, I'll be there with the Lord until He does come. But He is coming back. So, you think about the Thessalonians, they went through some hard times. First, uh, first Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. Notice what Paul says to them, And you became followers of us, and of the Lord, 
having received the word and much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Now you'll notice there, people are critical today about uh, you say you're a grace believer, and I'm thankful I am. And I'm thankful that I understand how to rightly divide the word of truth now like you do. And like the ones that listen on the internet. And I'm thankful that we follow Paul, the Pauline doctrine, Romans 6, Philemon. Well, you'll find in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, and you became followers of us. Well, who would be the us there? Go back to the first verse, 1 Thessalonians 1, 1. Notice the first word, Paul. Paul writes a letter. And Sylvanus and Timotheus. Undoubtedly they were with him. So we know, uh, yeah, you became followers of us. They followed Paul. They followed him, and you understand why they followed him, because they know, they knew Romans 11, 13, Paul's our apostle. And that's why they followed him. So you'll notice that there, and you became followers of us, comma. And the other thing is, and of the Lord. Have you often wondered there about uh, this, how the Holy Spirit put this in like this? And it's, it's right. Every word of God is right. And, but you think about, and you became followers of us, comma, and of the Lord. Well, they, they followed Paul and of the Lord. Well, you, gotta, you need to connect 1 Thessalonians 1 6 with Romans 16 25. And this is why, and of the Lord. And it's not a matter of, you know, people pointing their fingers and saying, you believe you're just following Paul, and it's, but we're following the Lord too, and of the Lord. Because who gave Paul the message? The Lord did. He gave him the mystery, the revelation, but the mystery to give to us. Look at Romans 16, 25. Now to him is a power to establish you according to my gospel. Paul says it's my gospel. Well, why did Paul say that? Well, my gospel... The Lord Jesus Christ gave it to Paul. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice it says, comma, and the preaching of Jesus Christ uh, according to the revelation of the mystery. So that's why you, Paul, the Holy Spirit writes that in 1 Thessalonians 1 6, and you became followers of us. That's Paul and Sylvanus and Moses there in the context, and of the Lord. But why of the Lord there? Because in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the, founding, since the world began, but now is made manifest. So he's preaching the, the Lord Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery is given to him. So, and they know that. The Thessalonians know that. So do you all see that? I'm sure you do. And th that's a big help there to understand that when you, when you see it. Now then, you think about Scripture. You think about the Word of God. We've got a complete Bible. We've got a Bible that we can trust. We've got a Bible that we can read. And we, we've got a Bible that we can learn how to use it by rightly dividing it. And as we rightly divide the Word, Romans 2, 5, Lamans to us. The rest of the Bible is for our learning. We read it all. We study it all. And we learn. We learn about everything with the rest of the Bible as well. So, you think about Scripture. Go to 2 Timothy. Not, you're not far off. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Hmm. 2 Timothy 3.16 You know, we need Scripture in our lives. I need it. You need it. The ones listening on the internet need the Scripture. We need the Word of God rightly divided in our, life, in our lives. Well, in 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is given to the inspiration of God. Notice that all. All Scripture. Well, when you read Romans 10.17 so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So when you think about the Word of God, you think about Scripture, what do I have to have? Well, I've got it for me, uh, so Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. If I'm going to have faith and walk with faith, I've got to have the Word of God. Well, what's, what do I have in 2 Timothy 3, 16? All Scripture. Notice that. All Scripture. What do we have in the King James Bible, we have all Scripture. What do, in the modern versions, what do they do? They leave out words. They leave out verses. They add to. But the Word of God tells us all Scripture is given their inspiration of God. Well, if we've got all Scripture, we've got it in the Word of God, 
What's it good for? Well, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given inspiration of God and is profitable. No, no step. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, we've gone over that many a time. So, what's it good for? For what? Look at verse 17. The word that. You see the first word that? It means intent or purpose. Well, what's the word of God? What's all Scripture is given for? What's it for? For what? That the man of God may be perfect. Well, what's the word perfect? Well, the rest of the verse will define it. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you're thoroughly furnished unto all good works, that's maturity. You see, you start seeing maturity in your life. And that, that's what the Word of God does. You've got all Scripture that's given the inspiration of God, and it's proper for doctrine. That's what we, for reproof. That's reproof, bad behavior. For correction, that's bad doctrine. Then for instruction in righteousness. So you see that at the, as far as maturity goes, it takes the Scripture. It takes all the Scripture. But Romans 2, 5, Laman is to us. That's what we build up our, the doctrine in our inner man. And understand, when you do that, and you write a divided word, you put gold, silver, and precious stones on that. You're building that in your found, on that foundation. And that foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you, have, you do it with wisdom and understanding and knowledge. You do it with faith, hope, and charity. And that charity is love and action. Now, let's take, for example, you've got Romans. You've got 16 chapters. The first eight chapters, we ought to have some doctrine built up in our foundation, in our life. So with that, go to Romans chapter 12. I'll show you something else here. I know we go and use this, but we're not going to wear it out using it. We need to see it and just keep repeating it and putting it in our inner man. Romans chapter 12. And you think about this. You think about life. You think about life, what is it? It's the ability to relate to things about you. That's what life is. And you think about verse 1 there. You've got the love of God's grace here in verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You've got your li a, a living sacrifice. When you see living what you've got there, that's an act of our free will. We've got a will. And so Paul is beseeching the believers at Rome, and he's telling them that you've got the doctrine in you in the first eight chapters, uh, and the chapters 9, 10, 11 tells you what about Israel, what's happened to Israel, and 9, 10, 11 will tell you that. And then you get to 12, it tells you how you live. Well, he's telling them there, present your body as a living sacrifice, and he says there, which is your reasonable service. In other words, he's just saying you're mature, you're maturing, you've got doctrine in you, now present your body as a living, a, a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service, it's just reasonable that, that you go to work and do the work of the ministry. And that, that's what he's saying there. And he told them there in verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. Notice that, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, renewing of your mind, that's a renewed mind thinking. That's what we're talking about, maturity. When you're going to grow and learn, and you, you're going to build on that foundation gold, silver, and precious stone, you're going to build wisdom and understanding and knowledge, you're, going to, you're, you're gaining maturity. You're getting maturity in your life. And you need that, and you, you've got a renewed mind. You think different than you did yesterday, or the year before, or five years ago, or ten years ago. You, your mindset's different. And the maturity part, here's an example of that. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And look at verse 15. We're talking about maturity. Philippians chapter 3, and verse 15. Notice what Paul tells the Philippians, these believers. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Now there's a key word there, that word perfect. Let us therefore as many 
as be perfect. There's the maturity. And, and then he said, be thus minded. Be mindful about what? That's what you ought to ask. Well, look at the chapter. Be thus minded. Minded about what? Look at chapter Philippians 3, 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, it is not grievous, but for you it is safe to write the same thing. So he's talking about the issue of safety there. And look at verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. See, that's the Spirit part. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That's, that's a thing out there as far as being thus minded. Be mindful about what? About being saved about having no confidence in the flesh. Be ye thus minded, Philippians 3.15. So what, why does Paul write that like that to the Philippians? Well, the Philippians couldn't keep their mind on Christ. Have you ever had that problem? And the answer would be, yes, we have. Not keeping our mind on Christ. That's why Philippians 1.21, he writes this verse. Look at Philippians 1.21. Even though these, these were maturing saints, the Philippians, they still couldn't keep their mind on Christ. Philippians 121. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's why he writes that. He's telling them, hey, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm going to keep my mind on Christ. Well, look here in Philippians 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. See, there's an issue with them about keeping their mind on, on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, go back to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 15. Philippians chapter 3 and look at verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, talking about maturity, be thus minded, and if, no that, in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. No that, and if, in anything you be otherwise minded. Well, it's maybe, now put in your notes, you haven't gotten what Paul said in the chapter. That's, that's, what, that's why he's saying that to them. They didn't get what he was saying to them. And what did he say to them? Well, in Philippians 3.3, 3, he said, and have no confidence in the flesh. You can't have confidence in this flesh. This flesh will receive you. And also there, in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. Paul said, I want to know him more and more and more that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His suffering, being made conformable unto His death. And Philippians 3.15, you go back there, No, that God shall reveal even this unto you. Read the, read the verse again. Philippians 3.15, Let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Well, how does God reveal this unto you? Through His Word. That's how he does it. And look at Philippians 3.16. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk with the same rule, let us mind the same thing. That's what maturity is going to look like in Philippians 3.16. We have already attained, let us walk with the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Well, when you look at it, you've got gold, silver, and precious stones. You've got wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. You've got faith, hope, and charity. Now that's what wisdom, that's what maturity is going to look like. Because he said there, in verse 16, Philippians 3, 16, Nevertheless, we're two we have already attained. Let us walk with the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Talking about maturity there. And that word attained there in 16, you come to maturity. You think about that. Nevertheless, we're two we have already attained. You come to maturity. I understand what Philippians 3.3 3 says, to have no confidence in the flesh. All the confidence is in who we are in Christ. That's the confidence. That's what Paul's telling them. But he said there in Philippians 3.16, let us mind the same thing. And when you mind the same thing, uh, let us, I'm sorry, let us walk with the same rule. I got ahead of myself. Verse 16 again, Philippians 3.16, nevertheless, we're too we have a Already attained, let us walk with the same rule. Notice that, walk with the same rule. What's the rule? You remember reading Galatians 2.20? Yet not I, but Christ. That's the root rule for maturity. 
When you, when you get to that point, and you say, yet yeah, not I, but Christ. And you can also let us walk with the same rule. The rule is, when, you, when you're maturing, you're mature, you're, you say, yet yeah, not I, but Christ. But also you'll say, Philippians 3, 3, I, I don't have any confidence in the flesh. I'm not living f this flesh. That's what I've been doing all the studying this week on spirit, soul, and body. And that's how God wants us to live. You know, if we're gonna if we're gonna live and have gold, silver, and precious stones, we've got to do it by spirit, soul, and body. We're gonna have wisdom and understanding. We're gonna have faith, hope, and charity, love. But you got to go spirit, soul, and body. If you try to go body, soul, and spirit, then what's that gonna be? Wood, hand, stone. You're going human viewpoint. You're going religion and all that type of thing. So here's the thing about Philippians, verse 16. Philippians 3.16, let us walk with the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Ask yourself this question, what if you're not walking by the same rule? What if you're not mature? What if you're walking body, soul, and spirit? What if you're not in the Word, walking spirit, soul, and body? Well, what you, you got? What happens when you're not as a believer? You've got to just stop, get back in the Word, and believe what the Word of God says. Believe First Thessalonians two thirteen. Rightly divide the Word of Truth. Put the Word in you, uh, and and believe, and let the Word start working in you, and God will get you to the point of maturity if you'll do that. So, what that means, and I'll just use myself, I have to be honest with myself to do that. I don't know if you were like this before you learned the truth, came to the knowledge of the truth, but I know when I first got saved, it wasn't always spirit, soul, and body, and I'm not happy with that, but we had body, soul, and spirit. And you'd be around, you'd be around people, and you'd want to talk like it's spirit, soul, and body. But you really wasn't doing that. You were body, soul, and spirit. You wasn't walking. You wasn't living based on who you're in Christ like you should. You wasn't material is what I'm trying to get at. And I remember days like that. So you got to be honest with yourself. Maturity makes... you got to make progress. And if I can ever give any advice today to the ones that listen on the internet, and all of us, including myself, we want to continue to make progress in our life and don't go backwards. That's, that's, you know, I want to take heed to that. I sure don't want to go backwards on what I've learned. I want to go forward. And I want to keep maturing and build on that foundation. Now go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 23. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 23. 2.23 Here's something to you. When you read this verse, this is why I don't like to answer questions that are foolish. 2 Timothy 2.23 But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. You know, let me tell you this. A mature person will not ask a foolish Bible question. Now you just think about that. So what are you dealing with when somebody's asking a foolish question? That means they're not mature, but they're babes in Christ. That's what it means. That they, need, they need some maturity in their inner man. And that's why, verse 23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid. That's why you avoid those questions. Knowing that they do gender stripes. That's all they'll do. So, Faith has to do with understanding the wisdom and knowledge of the Word. That's what it has. Hope, we know that one day it's all going to come to a conclusion. Charity, love, and action. Now turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 and verse 1. This is, you can see your identity here in Colossians 3, 1, 2, and 3. Verse 1, Colossians 3, 1. If you then be risen with Christ, 
and I always say it, I am. Seek those things which are above, and I'll say yes, and I am, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. That's what we ought to do. Do we always do it? We fail some, but that's what we ought to do. Not on things on the earth. Notice this in verse 3, for you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. You're dead to sin. You're alive unto God. But no, so where's our, where's our life hid with Christ and God? You know, there's a security right there. Then it talks about verse 5, mortify. You, you put, put these to death, put them off. But you go on down from 5 to 12, and you look down on verse 12 there. Put on therefore as the elect of God. That word elect, that's a title that you have since you're saved. Holy, that's another title. And beloved, those are titles. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy. And, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, notice this, put on charity. Notice that, which is a bond of perfectness. Charity is tied with perfectness. It's tied with maturity. And that's love and action. That ties our life together as a believer. Charity will hold a mature saint together. That's what it'll do. You've got that charity. You've got that love and action. You think like Christ thinks. That will, that will tie our life together as a, as a believer. That'll, that'll, charity will hold a mature saint together. And that's our goal. Maturity. Build on the right foundation. And I, I hope that this will be a help to you. Spiritual maturity includes gold, silver, and precious stones on that foundation. And you've got to have wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And also faith, hope, and charity, which is love.